migration, but how do we do it? Absolutely fair question. The reason that we've talked a lot, I think, or come to a lot of focus on entrepreneurship through unemployment is this sort of sense of you guys trying to take big issues like unemployment into your own hands and create a solution. Then you see people doing amazing stuff like James Eder and you go, gee, you know, I could do that and create 40 jobs myself, obviously. But what we do know, not everybody has been put in a situation where they have the means to fail fast or fail forward or fail in setting up a business, okay? And trust me, I've set up a business before and it, it wasn't great. Um, so, and then, you know, you look at something like Ariana, who's just completely amazing, and you go, uh -huh, and Branson as well. So, what does it take to do that? So, what we, we've been doing is we've had a couple of Google Hangouts with Doug Richard, who in the UK is one of the, um, those of you who know the program, the Dragon's Den was, used to be on Dragon's Den. Doug is an entrepreneur himself and a brilliant one. And as I told you yesterday, his mum just died. Um, so he will be carrying on after the summit with these Google Hangout how-to sessions. So I do urge all of you with all of those. Sometimes the One Young World team in London will be in touch with you and ask you to participate in visually in one of the little boxes on the Google Hangout. We can't have all of you in there, obviously. But I would say to you, do keep your eyes open when Louise and the gang are posting how-tos with people like Doug, because there is such good kids. Some of those sessions, honestly, it's like going to university and getting half an hour with someone who's really magic, and the stuff is there. Equally, Mr. Nunn's dialogues online, I know um, one of the Google Hangouts that he did on um, agriculture and agribusiness was just, was just phenomenal, stuff that you can't learn anywhere else. So to bring that live to you today, um, I'm going to bring back to the stage returning ambassador, Carol Stone, uh, returning counselor, Carol Stone. Carol is an entrepreneur herself, quite apart from being the most well-connected. Hello, Carol. <laughs> When Carol was first a counsellor with Bishop Desmond Tutu when we were in Zurich, the pair of them ran onto the stage. And David said to me, if Desmond Tutu and Carol Stone had a baby, how much energy would that be? <laughs> how delightful. <laughs> <laughs> so Carol is going to run this session with Bethlehem Alimu, who you met earlier, who's African Entrepreneur of the Year. Carol. Thank you very much indeed. Well, first of all, this is all about how to be an entrepreneur. Who here wants to be an entrepreneur? Good, a good, good, good number. Well, you can be. You can be one now when you're young. You can be one in middle age. You can be one a bit later on. That's a wonderful thing. If you've got an idea, you've got an inspiration, you can do it now. I started work at 18. I was a secretary, worked from 9 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock at night, and thought that would be my life. And for a lot of the time, it was my life. But then towards the end of that working life, I did actually establish an opinion market research company, asking people what they thought about issues of the day. And in fact, it was that very company that first asked what young people wanted to discuss at One Young World. So I was very, very proud of it. I was 65. That was six years ago. I'm now 71. So I started very late. <laughs> And what's more, I got married for the first time at 57, but that's not on the agenda. <laughs> so I'm saying you can do it when you want to, but of course, I'd rather you start it perhaps younger than that. But for someone who did start much younger, that Kate's mentioned and we've already heard from this morning, really is proof that there's huge potential for investment in Africa, which is a wonderful thing. And she is the CEO and founder of the ethical footwear company, Soul Rebels. And she's created lots of jobs in her home country of Ethiopia. The Forbes magazine said she was a woman to watch. For us, she's a woman to hear. A welcome to Bethlehem Alamu. She is. 
Welcome. Thank you. Well, we heard from Bethlehem this morning, and she sort of rather skated over how she actually got the business off the ground. She said that one or two banks refused her, but she got people around her, and she started it. So I want to know just a little bit more. If I was, you were about 25, were you? Yes. Mid-20s, much, much younger than me, 40 years earlier, she suddenly decided she wanted to... First of all, how on earth did you decide shoes? Um, that's a really good question, and I got that question all the time, and I'm going to explain it again. Um, why shoes is um, the way I grew up. I've, I've been watching people doing things by hand, which is really interests me to, to mobilize our, uh, the community in the business. One of the things that people do when I grow up, when I see it, is that spinning which is a culture that we had, and weaving people create a lot of fabrics from it. Um, so we had another, another culture, which is recycled tire shoe. People were wearing that recycled tire shoe for different reasons. First, it was cheap to buy. The second one is it was durable. You can wear them every time. They can last for a year or two. So I see those two uh, uh, opportunities working together. So I use the talent that I have around me, and I use the idea of recycled tire. So I come up with an idea of producing products from that. And how did you actually get those people around you? Did you suddenly, when you couldn't get anything from the first banks, how did you get that funding? Uh, actually, I didn't get any funding when I started my company. And I want to make sure that everybody here who wants to be an entrepreneur to do not go back because people refuse you. What I would like to say is if you have any idea and if you believe in yourself, your idea can be a bigger. Even if people say, well, this is not the idea that I'm going to support, but you believing in yourself and be passionate about what you do is the big bonus for you because nobody is responsible for your life but you. So. I grew up in Ethiopia, but I have seen a lot of people working every day to make it through, to go through in different uh, places and to, to make it through for a day. Um, I see people struggling to, to have a food in their mouths. And versus there is a lot of uh, people who are su supposed to support the, the, the community. So, if you want to be an entrepreneur, have a clear vision in what you are about to do. And then there is a lot of challenge, of course. You're going to come up with a challenge uh, to solve your own problems. Well, David Jones, our co-founder of One Young World, wrote a book uh, a, a short while ago called Who Cares Wins, meaning that people don't mind, young people, anyone doesn't mind a business making profit, but they do want them to give something back to society. Now, I think you formed a, a crash, haven't you, for children? Yes. Already? How, how do you take that? Did you automatically have a social conscience? Uh, yes. When we started the company, because we said we're going to empower our own people, we invest on the people themselves. So to be a social entrepreneur, you have to be blend the idea of social community service inside your business. So when you do that, it's, it's working together, and then it's going to be easier. It's going to be hard once you form the company to be able to socially conscious company. It's a little bit tough, but it's already blend in. And I always say that so rebels from the beginning in our DNA, we are fair trade company. So to get a fair trade organization's uh, certificate, it's just to have a transparency between us and our customers. Because these days people are saying we are fair trade company. How are you proving that? What's your criteria to be a fair trade company? So that's what we do. So to people, the people who had their hands up, what hope or inspiration can you give them? Will you say probably half of them will succeed? If they fail, certainly try again. But what, what was the moment when you thought this company is going to succeed? Was it the first order? Was it the, somebody first saying what wonderful shoes? What was it? And what sizes do you do? Because I take a size 10. We can, we can go. <laughs> 44, that is. We can, we can go to size 50. So it's we like you we can really order online <laughs> if you want to custom-made products also. So, so what was that moment? Problem. Um, what was your question? The you moment when you thought this is going to be a successful company. The first order, the first time someone wrote about it, what was it? Well, the challenge is that even if you have a big idea, even if you, you, you shake the world, but being in Ethiopia, being in Africa is a 
biggest challenge that I see. If I was born in the States or somewhere outside Africa, I mean, can you imagine where my company is gonna be? So the, the, the market that people build for us is down there. So you have to break in the market because when people see uh, businesses, they always want to see somebody else behind them, right? So we have to break in that your idea, really big idea, and you have to be able to um, manage and register your trademarks, things like that, in the right way. Because the formula is the same for me and somebody from United States, because it's a competition, right? It's a global business. So it doesn't give me any, any opportunity if I don't uh, compete with other companies in the right way. Okay, then we'll, let's take it back a, a bit from the practical. How much do you have to actually persevere? Did you have setbacks? Did you have setbacks before you had success? Uh, a lot, every day, actually. The challenge is coming every day, but um, one of the barriers was the market, to win the market, to win uh, customers. That's a big challenge. Even if you have a big product, good product, sustainable product, to win the market, you have to really work hard. Um, people say you have to do 10,000 hours to be the best in the market, whatever you're doing. But in my mind, I did 40,000 hours uh, because I spent more time in my company and to really see what's going on in the market, how I'm winning the market, where, what customers are looking for from their brand, and how am I going to create a job opportunity inside my community and outside my country also. Because of Soul Rebels is a global business today, uh, we managed to hire more than 20 people outside Ethiopia, which is a big bonus for us because whenever we open uh, a Soul Rebels stores, we hire local people. For example, we open a, a branded store in Taiwan, six stores. So we don't we don't bring in Ethiopian people to, to manage the stores. We hire local people, which are Taiwanese. When we, we open a store in Switzerland, we hire a local people there too. So in South Korea, everywhere. So we do have 140 people working for Soul Rebels, but bigger than that, we do have 20 international workers for Soul Rebels. And just for the, the practical side, I mean, if you've got to write a business plan first, if you've got to take it to a blank, bank, if you've got to go to a private investor, what would you give us a top I tip? did not go to the bank, but I did go to the organization who have a specific program for women who wants to start a business, but I didn't get any, uh, any support. But that pushed me really to the end that I'm, I'm going to do it by myself and I'm going to use whatever support and whatever idea that I can get around me. And my, my thinking is, if you're running a business, you don't have to run it as a charity. If it is a business, you have to really win the market. You have to be strong, and then you have to control your own destination. Don't let people control you, because it's your idea. Even if people invest in your, comp in your company, make sure that you're, you're in control of your own destiny. So. Well. You say it's your own idea. What about the problem of, in television, for example, where, where I've been some of my life, uh, people can pinch a program idea and put that program on. What about intellectual property? What about someone pinching your ideas of shoes? That's a really good question. After I start, after I launch my, my, my brand, there are a lot of companies coming to Ethiopia to invest, which is really good because they, they open a factory and they start their business and then hire local people. The problem starts when they steal your intellectual property. Even if they are coming, even if they are foreign company, they cannot win. That doesn't mean that they win the, the, the market because of different reasons, because of infrastructure probably, because of the product that they're producing, because People were doing the same thing for the last 20 years. They're just following in different form. So you make sure that your idea is your own by register your trademark and what you do. That's really important because if people see, if you don't know what to do about your intellectual property, people are going to steal it, your name. That means they're going to take your face off. They're going to put it in their face to sell your product. And it's not fair to do that. Um, 
what happened was like a month before, somebody, computer from my country who were working in the same industry, steal my intellectual property, register my domain name, forward it to, to his website whenever people, you know, uh, type in sonrabbits.com, it's going to his website, he's selling his product, do you think that's fair? No. If somebody really doing that on sonrabbits, on me, what's going on in the ground, startups and other entrepreneurs? So you make sure that you secure your intellectual property. I, I do have this kind of um, really good audience and then a stage to talk about it. There is a lot of people who, who are entrepreneurs who are doing good in their territory, but they cannot really have this opportunity to talk, to talk about it. So wherever you are, if you're in Ethiopia or if you're in South Africa or if you're in UK, you should have that done. Thank you. I would have assumed that you'd gone right for business and that you were a single woman. That's not the case. Uh, no, I'm not. You've got how many children? I have three children. They're durable, but <laughs> you can have it all. <laughs> and I'm married, and three, I have three children. And In a way, I suppose it spurs you on rather than hold you back. Um, it's going well, I guess, but it's sometimes when I travel like this, it's a little bit hard, but my family and my husband have been really supporting me from start to now and I wish they continue to support me to, to, go, <laughs> to go forward. Um, before we go to questions and answers for the second half, um, what, do you, what about the future? What, what's your next ambition with the, for the company? Uh, yeah, my next ambition is to be an apple of Africa. Is that possible? Yes. To be? An apple of Africa. Uh, apple is a ah, big yes, company yes. in the world, right? Yeah. So imagine so rebels being an apple of Africa. So uh, that being said, it's not just only an ambition, but we're taking the right uh, points to, to make that happen. One of the things that we want to do is we do have more than 10 branded stores today, but between five to 10 years, we want to have 100 stores all over the world, but branded stores by name of Soul Rebels. And then we're going to hire 5,000 people inside Ethiopia and another 300 people around the world. That's uh, the plan for Soul Rebels in the future. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think we'll now go to questions and answers because from that number of hands up, the probably still quite a few questions to ask. I'll take two or three at a time, but someone who's caught my eye in a red shirt down there is James Eder, who started Student Beans. Come up on the stage with your microphone for a moment, James, and tell us what you've done. Oh. Hi, everyone, again. Um, I know you've already heard from me for a few minutes, but to, to really make a point, what I just love to do is just ask for one volunteer, please, to put up your hand, just one volunteer, to come to the front. I saw your, you, you first, just the lady, if you can come. Can a round of applause for the volunteer, please? Thank you very much. A round of applause. Come on, a bit louder. It's not easy to come up here. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you this book, which I mentioned earlier, some jelly beans, and also my business card. Um, let me introduce, sorry, I'm James, your name? I sir. Great. Thank you very much. Go and sit down. Round of applause again for the volunteer. So, You've got so one minute, James. One minute. So the reason why I want to do that, because it's not about me, it's about you in the room, and it's about taking opportunities that you're presented with every single day. Now, that was an opportunity. It was a real opportunity for everyone in the room. I gave you my business card because I'm happy to mentor you and to provide you some free mentoring. But the reason why I did that, why didn't you volunteer? So I'd like to leave a quote and then hand back or kind of be involved in the Q&A. But watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. And that's by Frank Outlaw. And I just think it's so important. The opportunities are presented every day. It's whether you take them or not. So. Fine. Thank you very much, James. Excellent. If anyone can remember all that, I should be surprised, but I think the gist of it was very, very good advice. Thank you very much indeed, James. Okay, questions. If you could say who you are, and if you're an entrepreneur already, let me know, and uh, who's, that, who's there, okay? And where you're from, of course. Hi, I'm Dion from Montserrat in the Caribbean as well. Uh, I have a question. I own a small business with my mother. It's um, fast food. My question is, how did your first opportunity come about for you to expand outside of Ethiopia? 
um, and how do you go about it? Okay. That's a really good question because whenever people want to start a business, probably they want to start from local areas, right? But it's different for me. I did not start so rubbish from local, from Ethiopia. I am manufacturing in Ethiopia. Actually, I am selling my products in different countries. Why? There is a lot of products coming to Ethiopia from outside. There is no products are going out from Ethiopia, and we don't build our name as a competitor as a competitor out there. So I wanted to be. I really like challenge myself to break in different boxes. One of the box is that we are not competitor because of different reason. But now I am able to compete. I am not here because of I have an idea, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that next year, but I have done it. I have done it from scratch and I penetrate the market. You could do the same, but you make sure that your idea and how you develop your, your company makes sense for the others. Thank you. I'm going to take two or three at the time just because I'm going to get as many as I can. So go. Who are you? Where are you from? Hello. My name is Matthew Duxbury. I'm from the UK. Um, I just want to ask you directly, what made you make the jump from a stable job into becoming an entrepreneur? Because it's something that I'm looking to do. And it's just what stimulated to you to make that jump. I, I just asked it very quickly. I think I thought, you never know what might happen. Let's take a risk. Let's take a chance. Be prepared for failure. And so somebody said to me, a market research would be good for you. So I actually formed a limited company within a PLC. And it was very, very hard work. Lots of times crying at weekends. I can't do this. I'm exhausted. I wish I'd never tried it. But at the end of the day, what I always feel, I'm glad I had a go. Even had I failed, I'd be glad I had a go rather than not try. I sold my company two years ago, or all the shares I had within it. I paid off my mortgage, which is a wonderful feeling. And I'm very, very pleased I had a go. So it was just thinking, do it now. Don't wait for the perfect time. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Caleb. Congratulations for the great achievement. Uh, my two questions, mainly. One, how do you break the stiff competition against leading brands? Secondly, and how do you go about the high cost of uh, capital? Can you ask the second question? And uh, how do you go about sourcing for cheaper capital when there are high interest okay. rates? I'll let you answer those two. Is it two in one? Yes. Thank you. Um, how do you get market outside Ethiopia, right? That's your question, your first question. Our market... First question is, uh, how do you uh, break against uh, the big brands in the various how products? Break into the big brand? Actually, I did not break any big brand. I am another brand who's growing really fast because my products are really different than the other product. And my message for people is delivered through the products. What I'm selling is not a product, but I am sharing experience. People come and see different opportunities in Soul Rebels. For example, we don't produce one product at a time. We produce more than 150 products in a day, different ones. So when people see that, they, they believe that it's something different, something new for the market. That's how I get to the market. The second question is, how did you scale up your business, right? If I put it in one word. Uh, I scale up my business because I do have really good uh, relationship with people. People are working with me and I do have really good partners who do have a background of retail, marketing and those things. So I really work collaboratively with other people who knows the, the market, who knows the industry too. So that's how I get to the market. James, you've got a sport. Yeah, sure. just, Keep it absolutely. To, to build on that was kind of people do business with people. And exactly like you said, it's you know also the network of people in the room. If you think you're building connections now, and that's how you get in and work with bigger organisations and, and small as well. Good, I agree with that. As a networker myself, I think when you're here now, do take advantage. You're so lucky to be here and meeting these people. You may come back another year, but make sure you've got people's phone numbers, their emails, their Twitter accounts, whatever you want to know. Keep in touch with them, where you met them, what they look like, had a yellow jumper so you remember them, whatever it is, because you may well need them. And if you nurture people, it helps you throughout your life. Next question. Uh, hi, my name is Yasmin, um, Sudanese. Uh, my question is, um, well, Sudan is a very beautiful country, um, but it's also a country that's in constant conflict. 
Um, it's a country where um, you have a lot of talented people who are sitting at home. Uh, entrepreneurship is blocked, uh, actively blocked to an extent. Um, small and mid-sized companies do not always survive. So within such a context, how can we as young people, as entrepreneurs, change such a landscape? Let's just wait for that one. Let's have the man in the yellow jumper. Hi, I'm John George Shower from Zambia. Yes, um, my question is, because uh, uh, from just the time you started explaining, <clears throat> I've gathered a lot of facts which are as clear as daylight. So my question is, how can I upgrade, because uh, I'm a social entrepreneur, what I do is to see change in my community in terms of uh, prevention of HIV and AIDS. There are so many uh, problems that I would like to help my, in my community, but I've got some personal problems. So how can I marry the two? Social entrepreneurship and uh, business entrepreneurship. Thank you. So which one are you going to take first? Yes. <clears throat> um, thank you for your questions. I don't know what's going on in Sudan, but people are going to be responsible for whatever they want to do because that's their dream. So in whatever situation, I didn't have a lot of um, people supporting me from the government, right? I didn't have a lot of people supporting me from organization. And I don't think that's really important. What's important is your idea and what you want to do about it. And it's about your dream. If you're going to do it, of course, we're all going to take risks. Life is a risk. We always take risks. So. I would say to you, if you have any idea to develop any business in Sudan, I think it can be done. And you can do it around the way I do it. You don't have to conflict with governments and things like that. If people see the change that you bring and then they start supporting you, so you better start it if you have any ideas to do. Uh, to your question, I don't know what kind of business that you want to do, but I know that you want to empower your community and you want to deliver some kind of message for people to keep themselves from HIV. Is that what you're saying? So I don't know how to create a business starting from aid organization to the business. I don't know. What I know is start a business and support your community. That can work. You can have some idea and then you can start your business, but you can say you're supporting your community by teaching about HIV, HIV AIDS. I think that's the way to go. I, I'm so sorry, we've, we've got so many questions and so little time. I think I'll take one from gentleman over here. Uh, I'm Clinton from Unity South Africa. It's more of a statement as compared to a question. Good, uh, we like those. So I think the African delegates that are here don't really appreciate what we have at our doorstep at the moment with corporates looking at us as the final frontier. With them wanting to set up onshore, we've got the power in our hands right now to tell them, before you set up onshore in our continent, here's what we want, partner with our entrepreneurs, give women equity before you set up onshore, and address the youth uh, unemployment. So we, we use this as a negotiating tool before we actually let them set enterprise onto our continent. Thank you very much. Let, let the gentleman behind you, that was only a comment. Is your question or a comment? Uh, it's a question. I'm Good. an entrepreneur from Botswana. My name is Tegera. I wanted to ask you if you are a first generation entrepreneur and how does it feel to be, if yes, how does it feel to be a, a black, a first, a, a first black, you know, entrepreneur woman? Good, we'll keep that one. You? Let me answer it. How's it, how's it good? Do you want to answer that now? Yeah, yeah. No, he's going to answer it now. Go on. Uh, I am the first generation in entrepreneurship in my family, and my family completely never do business, and they don't, they don't have any idea about business. So I am the first generation. And it's really tough to be able to have your own idea and start from scratch, sitting in Ethiopia and using different uh, components like technology, things like that, to scale up your your um, idea and to implement it. It's uh, really tough, but I always believe in myself and my team also, we can do this. And you can do that too, also. I'll take the lady here in the purple, then I'll come back to you and then I'll come to you. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Uh, hi, um, my name is Sajda. I'm from Bahrain. Um, and me and my mom, we own a small business, a handmade business actually. Uh, my, my question is very simple. I have an idea, but I don't know how to implement it to be an, an entrepreneur. So my question is to you is what are the basic steps or the strategy you took to actually be who you are right now? Can Thank you hold you. that for a moment? That's a really good question. And when I start the, the business, I feel the same. But I understand that if I empower the workers that I have, if I pay the right amount of money for the talent that they have, and then if I give a sustainability for my workers, it's not like they're going to work today. If that something happens, we're going to fire them tomorrow. But you're going to have to train your people to be in your side and to believe in, in what you're doing. That's how I build my team. So I think that, support, that, that helps. Can I, can I just add one, one very quick thing to that? It was just around having the vision, but also breaking it down. What's the first thing that you can do to make a difference to start? Because people put it very in a big picture, but what just if there's one action that you can do to take that next step, and then the next one, and it's built up. So Thank you very much indeed. This, here we are. Mike, is it on? OK. Hi, I am Tepo Silwane, uh, a social entrepreneur from South Africa. Business has moved from ge geographical limits onto the internet. And the reality on our continent is that there isn't infrastructure for ICT uh, to support businesses that move into internet. What is your advice for people on the African continent, especially young black Africans in townships and underdeveloped areas, for them to move in and compete on the same scale that Europeans and other foreigners are competing in on the net? Um, sometimes when, you're, when you don't have a lot of opportunity, you seize the opportunity yourself. Why I'm saying that is we're, so Rebels is a pioneer of a lot of things. So, so Rebels is a pioneer of building a brand from scratch and scale it up in global level. So Rebels is a brand to start selling products online. How? Because there are people, there are companies who can do that. So you can outsource you need what you need to other companies who can develop that for you. So it doesn't have to be in Ethiopia. It can be done somewhere else. Thank you very much, Sister Edith. Yes, you're on. Hi, my name's Kate, and I'm an entrepreneur from the United Kingdom. I started my business at the beginning of this year, and we build commercial-scale urban farms that grow sustainable fruit and fish in cities. Um, in the past 10 months, probably everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong at some point. Um, I'm not, you know, it's fantastic, but I wondered um, for both of you what the worst thing that's gone wrong for you in your business and what you learned from it. Um. I went to a trade fair to Atlanta with my product to, to show what I'm doing. And one person came and said, this is really nice, so I'm going to write you an order. So he wrote an order. He didn't pay. So I was really uh, happy to get orders from somebody from Atlanta. So I took that order, I processed the order, and then I sent the product to him. And he don't want to pay. So I was like, what's going on? So I called to his office, somebody answered the phone. Guess what? Is everything OK in Ethiopia? I was like, can you pay my money? <laughs> so those are the things that you face every day. And other things, somebody ordered. We had a relationship for two years. And for some reason, this company or this person ordered 80,000 words product of shoe to sell it in UK. So we process the order, we send the order to him. The guy completely disappeared after he received the goods. By that time, shall I shut down my company? Because I am a startup. I cannot afford to lose $80,000 worth product. And sometimes people hit you like that to destroy you. But it doesn't matter, you keep going. There is a lot of catastrophe from somewhere, bam. But you keep going, so that's my, my only advice. one is. <laughs> On the, on the very first year I started the company, I took on a woman I thought would be good. She was absolutely vile, bossy, and terrible. I had to keep her for three months. I said, you can go or you can stay for the three months. She stayed. It was terrible. I'll never do it again. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thanks to James Eder for coming in for a man thank off stage, which was wonderful. Thank you, Bethlehem, and good luck for thank all you're doing. Thank well you. done. Thank you very much.
And thank you to you, Carol, as well, for chairing. Well done. Okay, so as you know, this afternoon you have three breakout groups. Uh, we have two fantastic sessions.